John, John, you made it. Wonderful. <laughs> Welcome. It will work out to the end. <laughs> all our, our all our prayers worked. We were, we were hoping we'd see. <laughs> <laughs> Bring in for global technology here. <laughs> That's great. Technology, global technology. Yeah. Your, your video was good, but hey, hearing you and seeing you in person is ten times better. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, th th thank God for that. Right. We're. we're... Well, thank you. Praying for the next 60 minutes, we, we technology keeps us all together. Yeah. Oh, yes, I think we need that <laughs> on my side. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Silicon Valley Conflict Minerals and Human Rights Forum. And it's great seeing a lot of familiar faces and also some, some new faces. So I really appreciate everyone joining today. Um, we have a, a pretty packed agenda. And so just wanted to we'll go ahead and get started. And so we're gonna start off uh, Pamela Russos from Miller Center will be talking about mining alternatives and the MAP project. And then John uh, will be presenting, John Gabriel from IBM will be talking about advancing ethical and sustainable um, those, are, those of you online, if I could please ask that you mute, um, mute your microphones and just only for the speakers at this um, point so that, so that everyone doesn't hear every, all the background noise. And then, then we're going to end it with some Q and A. So um, just ask that you save your questions for the end. Um, use, feel free to enter your questions in the chat box, and um, and we'll be answering those, compiling all those at the end. So just so we can we can get get through everything. So I'd like to first introduce um, Pamela Russo's. I've I've actually had the pleasure of working with Pamela at Miller Center, and just. Just, I don't know what we do without her, actually. <laughs> She's our chief community officer, and, um, and she'll be sharing a little bit about MAP. I um, hope all of you did your homework and uh, read the, the white paper, and um, we'll be happy to answer some questions at the end of that. So, Thanks, Lydia. Thanks for that gracious um, welcome. I really appreciate it. And uh, welcome, everyone. We're really excited to be uh, talking you today to share about um, our mining alternatives project at Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Um, and, but before I go uh, into that, um, Lydia, next slide please. I'd like to introduce everyone to Miller Center. Uh, Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship is a center of distinction at Santa Clara University. And so Santa Clara is a Jesuit uh, university in the heart of Silicon Valley. And at Miller Center, we see our role as combining the, the DNA of Silicon Valley entrepreneurship with the Jesuit ethos of, of social justice. And so our mission is to accelerate entrepreneurship to end global poverty and protect the planet. Next slide, please, Lydia. All the entrepreneurs that we work with are working towards um, achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, under each one of these uh, areas there's a specific target to be reached by 2030. And all of the entrepreneurs that we work with are helping to uh, create a more just, humane, and sustainable world. Next slide, please, Lydia. So for over 17 years, Miller Center has been working with social enterprises. Uh, we've worked with over 1,000 enterprises at this point in time based in 100 countries. And our focus with these enterprises is helping them build a, a the sustainable and scalable business and become investment ready. So we're really pleased with the fact that um, over these years, after going through our accelerator programs, they have been able to raise over $500 million. And our programs are um, basically curriculum, but really where the magic happens is that we pair entrepreneurs up with mentors. These mentors are primarily Silicon Valley executives who volunteer and donate their time to these entrepreneurs, uh, meeting with them on weekly Zoom calls for a length of the program. And oftentimes these uh, relationships with mentors continue way beyond the program itself. And so we often, I mean, 
often, all, practically always hear that the, uh, the real value the entrepreneurs get out of running, going through our program is the mentorship that they get through, through this. And we're pleased and proud um, and still working hard to be able to um, have more than 50% of the enterprises that we work with be women-led organizations. Next slide, please, Lydia. So that's a bit about Miller Center. Um, if you want to know more, you can go to our website um, or uh, send an email. We'd be more than happy to share uh, a bit more about our work. But I wanted to turn now to MAP, to our Mining Alternatives Project, uh, which is the, the reason for um, this, this presentation and talking to you today. Um, so one of the things that we were curious and wanting to understand was whether or not um, there was potential for getting women and children out of artisanal mining that we know that artisanal mining is hazardous, not only from a person, and pers a person perspective, but then also from an environment perspective. And um, we, uh, according to James Gordon, there's an estimated 35,000 children uh, working in these perilous conditions, uh, extracting cobalt. And the reason why children and women are in these mines is because they need to earn a wage. Um, in the DRC, of the 80, of the 80 million people, 72% um, of them are living in, on less than $1.90 a day. So the reason why children and, and women are in these mines is because they need to be able to feed themselves and take care of their families. So are there, the question that we were asking ourselves was, are there some alternatives um, that could provide them a living wage and uh, get them out of the mines? and be able to build and rebuild thriving, resilient communities um, in these mining areas. So the way that we undertook this project was um, we partnered with an on-the-ground uh, partner um, called CARF, the Centre Adrupe pour la Recherche et la Formation, uh, which is a Jesuit-led organization that Miller Center has been working with for over three years, um, teaching them uh, uh, Father Jean and his team about social entrepreneurship, how they themselves could adopt social entrepreneurship principles and be able to um, teach uh, social entrepreneurship principles to community members in which they're working. They're based in Lubumbashi and so basically right in the heart of, of the mining region. And so um, we undertook a three-phase study and I'm going to let uh, Father Jean tell you about the, the methodology that we used, as well as the importance of this. We're going to use a video because although Father Jean is on, um, many times when we have, we've connected with him, we have lots of uh, technology uh, uh, problems. And so rather than letting the, the, um, the gods of technology run amok, uh, we figured that we would just do a video. Um, and then Father Jean, if he is able to really join us on, with technology working, then uh, he'll be able to join us in the Q&A. So Lydia, if you can go to the next slide and, and uh, play the video, that would be fantastic. Lydia, we're not hearing it. I think if you take yourself off of mute, you should be able to hear it. And I work at Centre Arope pour la Recherche et la Formation, which is Arope Center for Research and Training. We have communities around mining industries that suffer a lot, yet with a mentality that the mining activities are the only ways to survive on. Our meeting with Miller Center, first of all in Kigali, then in Nairobi for trainings, gave us more strength. And we thought we could have a partnership with Miller Center as we continue now to see how we could implement all we have learned about social entrepreneurship. That's why we started the MAP project, which is the Mining Alternative Project with the goal to provide a focal point for corporate funders benefiting from cobalt 
to collaborate toward systemic solutions that are driven by the needs of the most vulnerable in the DRC mining communities. MAP had three phases. The first was to assess the negative impact, social, political, economic, environmental impact of the mining activities, be it industrial or artisanal, on the communities. Then we moved on to reflect and assess with them and see what are the ways and other solutions to get the people out of this racial circle of enslavement. And we're so happy to realize that the people really think of other ways. They think of schools for children that will prepare them to be leaders of tomorrow. They think of agro-pastoral activities for women and centers that will turn them in there and start developing their own economic activities. Great ideas. Then we assessed at the third phase other initiatives from other NGOs and other organizations. We're so happy to find that they exist and they are very good, but we thought we could make them stronger. We could give them that flavor of sustainability and scalability so that the community not only survive on one or two year project, but they know that there is something that accompanies them for the development. So at this point, we feel very happy to have done these steps up to this point, but we now see the challenges that are tomorrow. We need to implement and move forward and work with the community for their own development. And this is where we can only hope and wait for these hands, helping hands, that will give back smile and dignity to the people and the sense of agency that they became agent of their own development. And this gives us the job for us, all of us, all the stakeholders, the partners that will join us, a sense of belonging to one great humanity with the sense of restoring life for other people. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for accepting to be part of this experience. Thank you, Lydia. So, um, so as Father Jean said, uh, we un basically undertook this three-phase uh, approach. And the first phase, um, the, the Father Jean and his team actually interviewed uh, 316 community members to uh, find out, you know, basically what's going on in this community. And phase two, which was looking and, and seeing what solutions that the, the communities themselves wanted, because we were clear that we didn't want to be dictating or going in and, and, and presuming that we knew what was best for the community. And so what was, uh, what was the community looking for? And at, in, that, in those interviews, there was almost the same number of, of people uh, interviewed. And these were community, uh, community leaders, women, children, um, people that were in uh, large scale mines, uh, NGOs, religious leaders, et cetera. So taking a broad, a broad swath of, of the community to um, assess and, and understand um, what was going on and what they felt they wanted and needed. And so, you know, we heard uh, loud and clear that, that the community, as Father Jean said in the video, the community was very uh, wanting to understand and how to create um, alternative livelihoods. And so uh, another thing that we also heard was that um, in, with the large scale mines, um, oftentimes uh, local people are not uh, employed by these large scale mines and m many times that's because they don't have the training that's needed. So being able to provide uh, the technical training uh, for community members to be able to have uh, bigger um, opportunities was something that they identified. And then also, like we said, you know, the reason why children are working in these mines is that they need to ha be earning a living. And so just putting children back into schools, schools that we think of here in the United States and in Europe, um, wasn't, 
going to be enough, that doing uh, vocational training was um, desired so that the children would be able to learn how to do welding and mechanics and other ways for them to earn a, um, a living. So the recommendation uh, coming out of the study is to create a vocational education and enterprise uh, development center um, that does some of the, the things that Father Jean said in, um, in the video. And if you look at the white paper, you can see a lot more data about this. But um, teaching, uh, uh, particularly women, but um, people how to do best, you know, best practices for agro-pastoral uh, farming. Um, you might know that over 500 million uh, people on the African continent are subsistence farmers. And so training them on better uh, agro uh, skills, uh, agricultural skills, being able to have uh, better quality, better uh, yields on, on, what they're, uh, on what they're growing, fish farming, uh, we mentioned, we talked already about vocational and uh, technical training, entrepreneurial skills development, helping people build, you know, understand how to build micro enterprises, be it bakeries and washeries and other things, and financial literacy. So being able to do all this and be able to then help provide and, and, and create uh, thriving communities is uh, what, we were, um, what we learned and, and what we're recommending uh, to go forward. Next slide, please, Lydia. And then just wanted to share with everyone um, about an, an important announcement on August 24th about the Fair uh, Cobalt Alliance announced some new members um, to the Alliance. Uh, the new members are Glencore, the Responsible uh, Cobalt Initiative, Sono Motors, uh, Lifesaver, Miller Center, and CARF. Um, we're joining the founding members who are Fairphone, Signify, Wahoo, and a Cobalt and Impact Facility. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Fair Cobalt Alliance, basically it's looking to uh, create a platform, not a technology platform, but a platform to be able to um, kind of look at artisanal mining and in the cobalt sector specifically and how to uh, create responsible uh, uh, cobalt value chain. And so there's three uh, pillars, if you will, to this platform. One is to professional, professionalize the ASM, the mining sites. Um, as many of you know, again, these are very hazardous and, um, and such, and, and, but you know, that they'll go away is, is probably, is not gonna happen, not certainly in, in the very near term or even the medium term. So how can you professionalize uh, these mining sites so they aren't hazardous both to people and to the environment? Um, working towards a, a child labor-free mining. And the third pillar, which is why Miller Center and CARF is a part of this alliance, is uh, increasing household incomes by creating alternative livelihoods. And so um, we uh, at Miller Center are very thrilled to be a part of this alliance and be helping towards uh, doing uh, this in terms of creating alternative livelihoods. So the next steps um, uh, for the MAP project is uh, we want to do a landscape analysis um, in partnership, obviously, with uh, Father Jean and his team at CARF. And what we would, um, what we envision here is to be able to identify an ideal location for this uh, education and vocational training center. That, um, that and, and by that, what we mean is that we want to have it be community driven in terms of uh, community demand for this um, and, and understand what's going on in, uh, in this area where the, the sites would be so that as you know, we would be partnering with, with, up, with things that are already happening in, um, uh, in these communities. As Father Jean said in phase three, um, what, what we did was to go out and see what other activities are helping support these mining communities. And so we wouldn't want to be duplicating any of those efforts. We would want to be doing that in partnership and building strength with all of us. Um, what we would be doing as well in this landscape analysis is to be able to identify also, you know, basically we would look to create this center and then look to scale it. That's one of Miller Center's uh, ways of working is that we want to be able to scale uh, all the work that's being, the good work that's being done. So this landscape study will be a three, uh, rather, sorry, a six to nine month effort and um, cost $200,000. So. We're looking for that funding in order to be able to, uh, again, identify this, uh, the spot for this um, facility and then be able to extend and grow um, 
alternative, li alternative livelihoods in uh, mining communities around the DRC. Um, and then there's also the Fair Cobalt Alliance that you uh, can consider uh, joining and um, be a part of the team, again, that's looking to create a strong artisanal mining community, professionalize this so that everyone is building these thriving communities and systemic solutions to regenerate mining communities. So inviting you to join us on this, on this adventure. Um, the next slide, Lydia, please. So uh, Lydia is going to be sending out these slides to everyone, and this is a link to our white paper. So I encourage you to, um, to take a look at it. Um, again, if there's any questions or anything, we would uh, be more than happy to, um, to uh, discuss this with you. So thank you all for your attention. Very much appreciate your interest in the work um, that we're doing uh, with Miller Center and CARF. And uh, if you can, I see going on the chat window, I haven't been able to pay attention, but just keep putting uh, questions into the chat window and we'll be taking that at the end. So Lydia, thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela. And um, one of the, the things I, when I joined Miller Center, MAP project was something that just really, I, I was just so thrilled to be part of, it's very aligned with, with some of the work that, um, that the, uh, those of us in the forum, you know, are just so um, very passionate about. So with that, I'd like to now um, introduce John Gabriel. And so John is corporate manager of IBM's supply chain responsibly programs. Um, also like to, to um, introduce Lily Asia. John will be presenting today, but L Lily also um, part of, part of very, they're the, I call them the dynamic duo, is um, project executive for responsible minerals and responsible sourcing blockchain network. Um, so John will be covering uh, advancing an ethical and sustainable mineral supply chain. So with that, I'd like to, I'd like to welcome John. I'm going to stop sharing here, and uh, John, you can go ahead and. Yep, just give me a second here to come over to my computer. Wonderful. Okay, so um, thank you for that uh, very nice introduction, Lydia. And I would like to uh, welcome everybody to the call today. Uh, looking at the bottom of the screen, we have over 60 practitioners uh, on the call today. So uh, I know what it's like to take an hour out of your schedule. So I certainly uh, extend the appreciation of the IBM team that uh, you made time in your schedule to uh, attend and listen to us today. Uh, as Lydia indicated, we'll be going through a very high level presentation on some of the work we've been doing. Um, I'll say in the technology front. So what I'd encourage you to do today is you, as you look at this, and as we were planning this session out months and months ago, um, we said, let's look at, at presenting maybe two ends of the same spectrum, right? So you heard a great uh, story from the Miller Center, Father Jean, on the work that's going on on the ground. Um, we're going to show you a little bit of the work that we've been putting together uh, from the technology and from the, the user perspective, right? And what I'd like you to do is, as you look in, and listen to this material, um, think about what's possible, right? Because this is not about this or that, right? This is about both, right? This is about the continuity, the continuum of these various different kinds of projects coming together. So, uh, keep that in mind as we go through this. So as Lydia mentioned, um, myself, Lily, we're part of a nine-person team in IBM that's responsible for uh, our end-to-end -end responsible minerals work. And that bridges everything from the supplier to the industry groups, to our corporate headquarters, to our clients, our government filings, and offerings like this where we're trying to collaborate and bring different parties together. So uh, we have a very varied uh, work scope. And uh, when we look at, at today's presentation, really, um, th this is uh, a story that started 10 years ago, right? A lot of the practitioners that are on the call today remember those early days when 
as an industry group, EICC that I was leading at the time, uh, we got together and started to look at this topic of minerals and human rights and what we needed to do, right? Now at the time, none of the tools existed that we have today, right? So this was a very pioneering time. Um, and, and we decided that we would get into this field, right? We, as an electronic sector, would begin the process, right? Which many of us have now been on for, for literally 10 years. And many of us have stories to tell, like the graph that we have here on this chart that shows the progress that was made early on regarding defining, in this case, smelters that were processing these materials. Um, and the first decade has really been that as defined by um, relatively good success, but certainly not the end, the game that we want to get to, the end goal that we wanted to get to, which even 10 years ago, we talked about establishing that ethical and responsible supply chain. So this is a long-term mission, right? We know that as practitioners, right? In fact, you may say this is a career, right? I've spent 16 years now in this role, and I look ahead and I say there, there's many more years to go in front of us. So what we began to do in IBM about two years ago, it's Lily, myself, and the team um, working through this journey, reaching a point where we're like 80, 90% conformant in our smelters, um, thinking about what's next. Now, um, luckily, we work for a, a technology company. So... Uh, IBM uh, has established four strategic vectors of the future, and one of those happens to be blockchain. So uh, we began to take an interest in this. Our chief procurement officer in IBM uh, challenged his entire global organization to look at the four vectors of technology and find ways that we could start to apply that, not just for ourselves, but for the entire supply chain. And certainly blockchain is one of those vehicles. Uh, as a company, IBM's been very involved in this. I'll show you a chart a little bit later on with the names of some of the other blockchains we've worked on. But for those who may not be familiar, this is a new technology, relatively new, I'd say in the last five, six years. Um, and it provides us um, opportunities that we just haven't had in the past, right? Um, it's using technology to essentially harness supply chains, right? Uh, everything we've done up till now has been relatively manual, right? We're in industry groups, which we collaborate and they're extremely important. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, by and large, we're still working with things like CMRTs, CRTs, um, manual interactions with our suppliers, which are good, but Clearly, that's not the way to the future, right? If we want to attain the high goals that we have, we have to look at some other ways to do things. And blockchain will do that, right? Um, it's the technology that allows you to put together the network of your supply chain. Um, underlying all of it is speed and efficiency, is uh, confidentiality. It's transparency, though, along with confidentiality to give you that insight that you don't have today. And it generates trust among the members so that as we look at things like these high goals of ethical and sustainable supply chain and helping people in the far upstream, this is an ideal tool to do that. So about two years ago, we got together and uh, began to form a coalition. And we did that. And today, we, we call that coalition RSBN, which stands for Responsible Sourcing Blockchain Network. And the company's logos that you see along the bottom are those that have joined that uh, consortium, uh, have come together, and have said, yes, this is something we want to support, that we want to be part of, that we want to help to grow. And we've done that. A um, couple of the names that were already mentioned as part of uh, Fair Cobalt Alliance are represented here, Huayo Cobalt and Glencore, underscoring the fact that throughout this work, there's no one answer. It's not, well, I'm part of this and this is the answer, right? It's being part of multiple elements of this. So as RSBN, we came together and we've assembled a three-part solution. So this is not a pure technology play, right? This is not just 
IBM selling a piece of technology and saying good luck with it, right? It's putting together the triple crown, if you will, assurance, the platform, and the network. Uh, IBM is powering this with our blockchain technology and we're uh, partnered up with RCS Global, who's one of the leading assurance entities that's operating uh, in the supply chain. Um, so a little more detail on this, right? The, the blockchain itself, right? And, and we'll, we'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, the assurance piece, which brings in social responsibility. Many of us have been working on that as a parallel work effort, right? In addition to defining your, your mineral sources, what are we doing relative to things like labor practice, health and safety, environment, ethics, management system, right? And of course, network. None of this that we speak about here today is possible to be a success by any one company. Uh, we've learned this over time, right? Um, those of us who've been part of EICC RBA, that goes back to the year 2004, 16 years of working together. And that's the road to the future, right? Is that continued collaboration. Now the blockchain itself, as I mentioned earlier, right? The traditional ways of doing things have really run their course, right? If we want to, if you want to make that next step, get that quantum leap into the future, uh, we need different approach, right? Um, manual ways of methodology have limitations. Um, saying, well, we'll have a central clearinghouse, right? Well, that would require establishing a lot of overhead, a lot of structure, right? Blockchain eliminates the need to do that, right? It distributes out the source of information and through the construct of the technology, the system essentially, once it's built, it, it runs itself, right? With very little overall administration. And the interesting thing part about this, and we can talk about this for days, right? You know, the benefits of this technology, but we're starting to see now a mind shift um, in, in, even in regulators or governments, right? When they look at things uh, in the past, it was traditional or even like Dodd-Frank, right? We'll write a law that says companies must do this or must do that, must report. Um, and then step away from it, right? Go figure it out, right? But what we're seeing now is some, um, some intellectualism going on, right? To say, well, if our regulations are gonna go into place, uh, what are the means to articulate that? What are the means to drive that? So recently, um, Photovoltaic Magazine had a very nice story about this. And uh, they, they even quoted and said, you know, regulators of the future are looking at things like blockchain saying, yeah, this is, the way this could actually occur, right? So a, some combination maybe of uh, legislation to outline, point the way, and then to use this kind of technology uh, to make it happen. So I wanna share with you kind of a graphic that we've developed and we use, and it's really a schematic here. So think about this more schematically or conceptually of, of what that blockchain could look like for responsible minerals. And we actually put this together in a workshop meeting that we had about a year and a half ago, where we invited in a number of different stakeholders to say, uh, what could this look like for responsible minerals? So you kind of think of the, the black circle as the blockchain. And then the colors, the blue nodes are the different entities here. And that would be different players, okay? And the, and the lines that kind of intersect and tie those together um, in this case, could be different materials, different minerals, right? So we, we took a green line for cobalt and we took a gold line for, for 3TG. And, and we started to lay that out, right? And say like, even with each node, you would have users, you would have certain personas, certain data would go between entities and not all data goes to everybody, right? And that's part of that confidentiality aspect of this. So as you kind of, your eye goes around that, you can see and say, yeah, that represents pretty much the entire blockchain, right? From miners to processors, to smelters, to exporters, importers, transporters, NGOs, right? You know, that, that represents the world. So as we started to put this together, we said, yeah, we can do that, right? IBM, we know the, the way to put those kinds of complex blockchains together. But we did this in a way with RSBN. If you look at the, the panel there, that white panel, uh, there's a couple of bullets in there, 
right? And, and it comes back to the things that uh, you heard in the Miller Center presentation, right? Doing this is not just being done as a pure efficiency play, although that's a part of it, right? Uh, but the other elements of this from the, the companies that are in this consortium is to do this in a way that we can downstream as we build this out, ensure that we are addressing those human rights issues, that we are using this technology to improve um, the livelihoods of those uh, far upstream, right? We're the benefactors of their hard labors, right? The, the materials that they mine, process, go into our products. So we want to find a way and incorporate that into the blockchain, right? And, and we have ways to do that. We have plans to do that, right? Because for many of us, this is personal, right? Uh, myself, I've often told this story. My grandfather was a child laborer in Pennsylvania. He was what was called a breaker boy. So today you see pictures of teenagers working in mines in the DRC, breaking rocks. Well, that was my grandfather uh, less than 100 years ago in upstate Pennsylvania, right? Picking slate out of the coal that was being processed to sell to people to heat their houses, right? So um, this is a similar scenario. It's just 100 years removed, right? So the timeline of activities that we've accomplished uh, we started with cobalt, right? A lot of the companies you saw on that list are involved in automotive. They're involved in the manufacture of batteries into electric vehicles. So we said, okay, we'll start with that. We did a cobalt. We proved out the technology. We've worked that out and we've perfected it. And we went into production um, at the end of June. So the lights are on. This is a usable tool in production. You can put your materials through it tomorrow. We're now working to expand this to 3TG. The construct of this particular blockchain is uh, material agnostic. So another way to think about it is we're, we've built a railroad here. We have the tracks, right? The trains are the different materials. So you can bring your different trains to run it down the railroad here and, and complete your mission. So we're actively working right now, Lily, myself, uh, members of the IBM Global Business Services team are out contacting firms in the electronic sector, and we're available uh, any day to go through this with other interested parties. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we've had a lot of experience in blockchain itself. Um, so IBM um, has been a facilitator of some of the other more popular blockchains, such as TradeLens, which works on the global shipment of goods through containerization, Food Trust. Um, which is maybe one of the largest blockchains in the world, um, working with retailers, wholesalers, and farmers to be able to track and trace uh, the progress of foodstuffs through the global supply chain. And one recently, Trust Your Supplier, that we've worked on. Now, the point with this chart is blockchains don't have to be all-encompassing, right? Through the technology and the interchange of information, you can set these up as a honeycomb. And that's how we view RSVN, right? It won't necessarily be a standalone to encompass everything. It'll interchange with other blockchains. This is just a real schematic of what some of the screens look like, uh, where you'd be able to lay out and construct your supply chain. So we view RSBN as a community tool. You join yourself, you bring your suppliers, you bring your customers, right? And through the various screens, depending on your position, uh, in, the, in the supply chain, you'll be able to see your upstream supply chain. Ultimately, the upstream will also be able to see the downstream. And you'll be able to get information, controlled information, regarding the amount of material coming through a given supplier and their responsibility. And that gets us to the assurance piece. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of blockchains are set up to track and trace the flow of product. And that's perfectly fine. Um, in the case of responsible minerals, we wanted to go the next step, right, which was to ensure that we couple with that um, responsibility, a way to quantify companies' um, conformance to the OECD guidelines, as well as other factors such as RBA code of conduct, labor, health and safety, environment, ethics, management system. So we have a, a way to do that. Why is that important? Well, the practitioners on the call know this, right? Um, not a day goes by, not a week goes by that we're not called in and asked a question about, are you using a certain supplier? or What's the responsibility of your product, right? Or of your supply chain, right? These are burning questions 
that all of us have to deal with. And we all want to be able to answer that in a more effective manner. So we have found a way to do that. The network itself is the people or the companies that are part of this, right? This RSBN is not an, an IBM owned initiative. It's not something we say this is ours. It's owned by the community, right? All the members who are part of this and who will join us in the future, right on back to the mind level, will play a part in this, right? Will influence the management of this, of the featureization of it. So we, it's a very open and democratic system. Um, the benefits are many, right? And I'm not, this is an eye chart. I'm not asking, there's no test on this today. Um, but we spent about four months working on a business value design, uh, looking at all the possible angles of what RSBN can deliver. And, and you can see across the top, these are the major headers, right? But along the bottom there in the blue are some of the more salient points here for those of us who work on this day to day, right? Um, today, uh, answering any question about traceability in your supply chain, uh, you know that is a long process, right? And it's an approximate process, right? Um, if, if a story breaks about uh, child labor in a certain mine in a certain part of the world, um, I'll be honest, it takes us months, right? Four, five, six months to try to even assess if that's in our supply chain, right? Um, having a system like RSBN would allow you to have that visibility on an instantaneous basis. And that builds trust and credibility with your customers, your shareholders, right? With the media, with NGOs, that's important, right? Um, from a brand perspective, certainly getting involved in this is something that it's that next step in the evolution, right? It allows you to say, yeah, we're part of this community, we're using technology, and it's getting us to that point where we're going to make those lasting improvements throughout the supply chain. And what we've also known, the research has proven this, there's some very large numbers there on that slide, right? About the value to your product, to your brand. Today, you don't see too many companies advertising things like, yeah, we have a socially responsible supply chain. The reason for that is we all know that's fleeting, right? That could change tomorrow. But when you get to a point where you have a lot of this into something like blockchain or an RSBN, uh, you'd have a lot more confidence about being able to take that and present that to your end customers. And it's been proven. Customers will respond favorably to that, right? You or I know if we walk into a store and brand A can say that this is what we've done in the supply chain, we can tell you where this comes from, uh, you're going to have a tendency to want to purchase that as opposed to something where there's a lot of questions, right? Um, so what we'd like to do is, is, as we start to kind of wind down this session, uh, you can see my name, Lily's name here. Um, we would be very uh, pleased to be able to work with any of you on a day-to-day -day basis, give you a deeper presentation on RSBN, and take you through some of the various membership options. So as we look at these next steps, and we're going to wrap this up and then go to some question and answers here, I want you to kind of reflect again on what you've heard this morning. There's a lot of good pieces out there, right? We, we've talked here about RSBN. Um, you've heard about the, the great map project from Miller Center, from Father Jean. Think about this, as I said at the start, this is now a great opportunity where we can start to put together the pieces here and really make the progress on the ground throughout the supply chain that 10 years ago we talked about but had no way to get to, right? We knew we had to walk before running. And now we're in a position where we're in the chocks, right? There are these projects that are out there. I encourage everybody on this call to consider what you can do to get involved in these various elements, right? And this is just, we'll end on this today. This is a picture of a session we put together back uh, October, almost a year ago. Uh, in California, we had the opportunity to bring together about uh, 20 different companies throughout the entire responsible uh, mineral supply chain. So we had mining companies, processors, we had consolidators, we had traders, we had end customers together for an evening. And we had an opportunity to get together and talk about the RSBN, the concepts, things like Miller Center, right? And coming out of that, it was a resounding yes, continue, right? This is what we need, right? And the collaborative effect was amazing. Just that very night, in about two to three hours, we were forming relationships between companies that knew their materials ended up in each other, but never knew each other, 
right? So that's, again, one of the beauties of a blockchain technology allows us to come together. So whether it's through that RSBN, the MAP project, Miller Center, these are all the aspects that are available to you today. So with that, we'd like to thank you for your time, uh, your attention, and we know we've seen some chats coming in and there's some maybe some other questions here. So um, in closing, uh, Lily and I are again at the ready. Our team, our GBS team will be uh, more than happy to set up a longer detailed session with any of you to go through more of the details here that we weren't able to cover today. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Lydia and uh, I think her helper, Jerry, who may have been compiling some of the questions here. So I will hand back my screen. If I can do that. Okay. And great, I'll great. Back into your control there, Lydia. Yeah. Th thank you so much, John and, and Lily. And I'm just really excited about this, you know, the partnership and, and like to open this up to others to there's plenty of opportunity to get involved. So um, I'll be sending out this slide. So, you know, just um, the contact information so you can feel free to reach out to to Pamela um, on, or John um, and Lily on IBM side. So Jerry Jensen, I'd like to introduce Jerry and Jerry actually was very, um, very involved on the MAP project as well. And so Jerry is a director of partnerships at Santa Clara University. And um, Jerry, thank you so much for compiling the questions. I know that I, I, there's, I'm, I'm sure several that have come through and so appreciate you compiling that for us. And so if you could please um, read off some of them and then we'll, we'll answer them accordingly. Great, thank you, Lydia. Um, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, that, there, we only have 10 minutes, uh, but there were, three groupings of uh, questions. One um, around the issue of, um, there are a lot of other projects out there uh, that are doing things related to what MAP is doing, uh, helping children find alternative, li uh, alternative employment and women find alternative livelihoods. Um, and I think I'll, I'll bat that to, to Jean. Is Jean still with us? He was here a minute ago. Yeah, I'm there. There you are. Yes, if you could just speak a bit, uh, uh, answer. Okay. Christina had a number of questions around other um, uh, initiatives that are in the DRC, uh, very similar to what MAP is doing. And you know, what differentiates uh, the MAP project and our vision going forward from some of the work that that's uh, that's out there now? Um, again, with a big caveat that. One of the goals of this um, uh, initiative was not to duplicate other efforts and to and to look for ways to complement um, ongoing activity. Yeah, uh, we are talking about a country which is uh, one fourth the size of the United States of America, and uh, we are talking about places where people are working that are really scattered. It's not just in one particular place, and they are not close to each other. And uh, when you think of cobalt in the world that people are using today, 60% of it comes from the Congo. And you can imagine the number of people working on those sites. So we know and we are aware that many other organizations are doing a lot of great things. And we have done that, I mean, to assess what people are doing. And we thought we could bring in our own touch, which is actually the idea that projects to help a community is not just a one year, two year, three year project. It's something that has to work with the community all through. And uh, what we are thinking is something like I was thinking of an idea of having my bedroom in the community and my bed there. I mean, I work in the morning with the people, work with them, and it's eventually what we would be seeing is people rising. It's not just one section of their life, but everything together. That's how I'll think of it. A lot of those projects, I, I mean, that we really appreciate, it will be I tend to think of some kind of isolation of some problem, but I can't think of the problem of Congo in terms of isolation. It's a whole big thing. And we think with kind of this kind of engagement, working there with the people, we may bring some difference. And that quickly what I could say. Great. No, that, that's, that's good, John. Thank you. 
Um, there were some other questions around, you know, do we really want to remove women from the mines? And, uh, you know, aren't we really trying to make the mines, uh, the ASM mines in particular, safer and more sustainable in case women do want to work in the mines? And, you know, I, I'm going to, uh, David, are you here? David Sturmes from FCA? Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, clearly that that's I, I think that's one of the goals of the FCA is is to uh, you know, try to make um, to professionalize the mines. Do you mind speaking to that? Oh, perfect. And then thank you very much for all the presentations and the debate that is going on in the chat. Um, very interesting and, and very lively. Um, but I 100% agree with anybody that, that says we need to be careful not to. Um, describe ASM only as something negative that people want to get out of. Um, we really um, now work with the miners on, on the ground um, through partnership with CDM and, and expanding that a lot, trying to make working conditions safer and create decent jobs within the mining sector. Mining has a, an average income here for many people that exceeds many of the other alternatives that are accessible to them. And that is uh, not limited to men, but also counts for the women that are engaged in that work. And, and so here we're looking at trying to addressing the health and safety issues that many women miners um, are concerned about. And most women are engaged in the washing of ore, um, which means that they, they st st literally stand in water most of the time trying to increase the purity of the mineral before it's being sold. And then through that, um, they suffer from rashes and, and skin diseases and that they complain about and are exposed to a lot of heavy metals that can also impact pregnant um, women and have an impact on the children there. And so it's very important that we, we work with the mine, uh, miners and, and the women there to address this. And this is something that has already been done at, at, at other mine sites like the Motoshi project, where through the provision of PPE, these hazards have been controlled and, and the issues have been addressed. So. Um, we are not the first to do this, um, and we definitely <laughs> will continue to do so now and, and hope to expand this to other mines in the coming years and, and really try to create decent jobs for women in mining. Great. Well, thank you, David. Um, and then lastly, there were a number of questions around blockchain, you know, the pros and cons of blockchain, um, what you, you get out of blockchain, um, you know, what can be done on, on, on a blockchain platform. Um, you know, how ASM uh, is going to be incorporated into blockchain. And I wonder if, uh, if John could, could address some of those questions. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the short answer is everything could be done on a blockchain, right? The, the more pertinent question is, you know, what's, rel what's relatively important to uh, the specific blockchain you're in? So if I go back to the work that we did on our pilot, um, it was very important for us to have um, companies that were involved in mining, such as Huayo, companies that were involved in trading, like Glencore, companies that were processors, like LG Chem, uh, and end users, like Ford Motor Company, to be able to look at this and say individually, what's important to me, have that discussion with the technologists, right? The people that are the brains, if you will, behind the development of, of the blockchain, and we did do that, right? Um, and, and because what you find is the needs of the different players on those nodes is, is significantly different, right? But the, the underlying technology can be constructed to allow for the flow of that material and, and that information in a meaningful fashion, right? With the appropriate controls of confidentiality in there. Now from the ASM side, um, ultimately taking this upstream is, um, it is a challenge, right? We know that. Um, we've spoken with some companies that have mining operations in the DRC, right? We had some of their input. Um, ultimately, we can view this as we said early on, right? This needs to be a collaboration, right? ASMs are a point on that, on that uh, blockchain node. So we see, we've got some ideas of how to partner up with different entities, right? That have operations on the ground, that are the conductors of business today at that level. Because uh, we view ASMs as similar to what the prior speaker just said, right? Um, you know, our view of this, ASMs are a critical part of the supply chain, right? They're not gonna go away. 
today, whether it's in the DRC or Indonesia or Peru, um, they exist and they provide an important part of the supply chain. Totally separate from this discussion, but IBM has a 51 year history of diverse supplier work, right? We do over a billion dollars of business with small and medium sized companies around the world. ASMs fit into that model, right? There, there's, that, that's a fit, right? So we look at that as part of the continuum here, but we realize we will take what we're working here, customize it to be able to marry up and fit into that environment, right? We've got some ideas, right? And it may take changes in, in the business flow, but that comes back to some of the things that MAP has focused on, right? How do you take today and transform it into tomorrow, right? So that you preserve these livelihoods, but you make a way that they can integrate into the world market in a more effective manner. And their blockchain has allowed you to do that, right? And we've done that with some other things like food trust, right? Where you have very small farmers uh, are involved in that blockchain, right? Their products are in part of that uh, global supply chain that is going out to the major uh, retailers around the world. So uh, this is all what's possible and it'll occur by people joining and, and becoming part of this, bringing in their ideas um, and coming up with the solutions, right? But we have the toolbox now to do it. So we're excited for the next decade here um, it's really going to be a, an exciting ride. That's great. Uh, I think there's one more question that hasn't been answered in the chat. Uh, and I think I will bat this to either David or John. Um, mm. Is there a, a political economic analysis of, of why a ASM has, um, has, has been created in, in the DRC and other countries? Um, what's the best analysis that's out there that could, that could give us a better understanding of why ASM exists? Um, yeah, happy to, to speak to that a little bit. And I put a, earlier on, I put a link in the chat box to the Digging for Change report, where I think in the introduction to that report, where we zoom in on two mine sites, we do also reflect on the history of ASM in the DRC. And the DRC has a long lasting mining history as it's one of the wealthiest countries on earth when we look at their mineral endowments. Um, and a lot of that was dominated by LSM. Um, but then as Gekimin and the, the national mining minist uh, company collapsed um, or reduced its effort much um, due to financial mismanagement and, and other issues um, about 20 years ago. And, and then in light of a couple of, of uh, instability and in wars at that time, um, I think it was 2003, um, ASM has really stepped in to um, also deal with the market demand. And, and, and so that is specific to, to um, 3T and then Cobalt that, yeah, they filled a vacuum and, and really fulfilled a really important role to meet global demands. But at the same time, we can see ASM being something that is not always driven by poverty or desperation. Um, in some commodities, if we're looking at gemstones or gold as very precious materials, um, and in gemstones with, with up to 80% of sapphire production or topaz production coming from artisanal mining, it's just the nature of the mines and the deposits that, that forces to have a, a small operation. And then obviously artisanal mining itself is just the result of a lack, to, uh, lack of access to finance. And, but yeah, it, it is not something negative, it's something positive to embrace and it can be a driver for development in the countries where it happens. And there's more than 40 million people in the artisanal mining sector across um, minerals. And so it's the second biggest livelihood after farming and that's often overlooked from a Western perspective because for us, where mining happens, it's large scale mining and it's not a huge driver of employment. Um, but really across Africa, where a lot of artisanal mining happens, it is an important livelihood and it's uh, a valuable and a decent working opportunity if we provide access to finance and access to training. So yeah, I, I wouldn't discount it as something that is bad that we should get rid of. Great, thank you. I think we're at time, Lydia. Well, thank you all for joining today. I, I'm happy to see all the new faces. And again, I'll be sending out the slide set with um, contact information, encourage, everyone to get involved where you can and um, you know together we can we can we can make a difference here so looking forward to uh, the next forum we'll be 
sending out um, before the end of the year, um, as we do this every quarter. So I um, look forward to, to seeing some of the new faces today joining us the next time. And, um, and feel free to invite others. Thank you so much and uh, have a great, um, great rest of the week. Thank you, Lydia, for putting this thank together. You. Thank, hey, you thank you for the center. Father Jean, thank you for calling in. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, take care. All right. Yeah, bye. -bye. Bye. Thank Thanks, you everyone. All. Thank you.